Thank you, Beverly Nyalkoa, for those wonderful insights from within your own practice in our community. The next speaker uh, is one of these magnificent daughters of sky women, of sky women such as we have in our community. Iwagyalakwa Louise McDonald is a Bear Clan mother of the Mohawk Nation from the territory at Akwazasne, who was condoled in the traditional chieftainship title of Dehana Kahline, Dragging Horns, since, since 2005. The title has been in her family for almost 100 years. She is also a ceremonialist in moon-based rituals as well as a uh, sweat lodge uh, leader tending to maternal and child wellness in her community. She conducts coming of age ceremonies called Oharogo under the husk for adolescent youth in her community every spring. As clan mother, she bestows ancestral names upon newborns in her clan and has the vested matr matrilineal authority to select a man into the chieftainship title. She works as a healing master for the St. Regis Mohawk tribe in a remediation project focused on cultural restoration. With that, uh, Louise Duakelakwa. <clears throat> so. They forced us to eat lunch real fast, and now I'm wondering if it's going to stay down. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So what do you think happens to us Indians when we drink too much tea? We drown in our teepee. It's an old Indian joke. But anyways, I had to do something to relieve this pressure. <laughs> so, <clears throat> yeah. I didn't even know how to work this, so bear with me. But um, oh, logo, and uh, I think what my uh, sister um, Beverly talked about was um, pretty bang on when she uh, recites the statistics, and she's in the trenches of seeing the health and well-being of our people at the clinic, and also uh, in the political circles that she now uh, moves in, we get a real taste and a real uh, picture of the landscape. Uh, on the reservations. So bear with me. Uh, my English gets kind of backwards sometimes because uh, I'm always doing on-site translation from English to Mohawk, Mohawk back to English. So, uh, so I'm a little backwards sometimes, but here we go. So um, Ohologo grew out of uh, a need. Uh, I'm a mother of five, grandmother of uh, five uh, with six on the way. So my investment is purely uh, driven uh, inside the family and the need of the family. And um, way back in the day, <clears throat> I, I grew up kind of uh, out of the ordinary. And um, I went to school not speaking English and had to learn uh, English. And uh, my mother didn't speak English either. So, um, and I entered uh, the elementary school really late. Uh, so a lot of my teachings have been uh, living in the woods and down the swamps of uh, G. So um, I am a little backwards, but anyways. So to talk about this thing here is it grew out of um, me watching our young kids and uh, on the res and s starting to see them begin to mimic other cultures and um, attaching themselves to the MTV culture and how they blend out, and they had a thug attitude, and um, and I look at them, and I'm thinking, what is the cause of this? And then I realized that it was us, the adults in the community, who are really failing them because we weren't giving them anything of their own selves to begin to mimic, or to be a part of. So um, I gathered all the knowledge bearers, all the men in my community and sat him at the table and said, what is it that we can do for our young men? And uh, we went hours on end talking about what, what was, what can be, what, what it can look like. And I got really excited thinking that, you know, my two sons would have, you know, all these wonderful uh, knowledge bearers and medicine men and speakers and 
uh, ritualist um, help him in his transition from being a boy to a man. And I was really excited up until the moment when one of them stood up, stood up and told me it was none of my business and that it's men's business and that they would take care of it. So that hurt a little. But anyways, uh, a year later, I was still waiting for them to do something and it didn't get done. So I became this maniac woman who would start stalking one of our faith keepers in our lawn house and I went after him with a vengeance and didn't give up until he finally sat down with me for half hour at the Alkazasna Freedom School, which is also a grassroots movement, um, an immersion school. And he finally gave me half hour of his lunch and we talked about what could be and we drafted up this um, knowledge and we spoke inside our language and we removed the dust and we pulled from the earth those old things the ancestors used to say to us. I had no manual, I had no design, I had no idea what I was doing other than a prayer to re recognize and realize that we had to do something for the young men in our community and my son's uh, at the core center of it, so I thought, but I realized I'd be very hypocritical if I raised my sons with all this knowledge and they didn't have peers like them to share that with or to grow up in. So um, I dug my heels in and took seven boys up on a mountain uh, 10 years ago and out of that grew Ohelogo. And um, a lot of people like to call it a program. I like to call it a ceremony because that's exactly what it is. And it grew from our language and it grew from the hearts of our people. And it grew from within the doing, not the talking, but the doing. And um, I became very passionate about this. And so we started out with seven boys and going into the annual ritual this May, we're gonna have about 70 kids to initiate. Um, and that includes both, not just the boys, but also our young girls. And I love it. So are you ready for a ride? Okay. All right, so here we are. Oh, logo. What does that mean? Uh, rites of passage, coming of age. There's all kinds of things all over the world that, in different cultures that do things for their young people. Okay, how can I make this go? Okay, thank you. Um, it's not technically advanced here, but anyway. Okay, next one. It's not it. Well, while we're figuring that out, okay. Okay, next one. Everybody knows who I am. Okay, so here's um, uh, Dehawi Zolas, uh, Kenny Perkins. He's our lead uncle. And uh, for the first eight years of moving this, um, I used to work both sides of the women's part and the men's part because it was difficult for me to find my alpha male, my counterpart, but I finally did find him. And uh, we had to um, put down a really strong prayer to find my equivalent. And here he is, and he's at home cover me on the ground now that I'm here in DC. So next, under the husk, as Bev showed you that picture of our creation story, Sky Woman, there's this wonderful thing called downfending. It's called dehodinodode in our language, which means they're, um, they're secluded, they're taken away, and they're under a blanket of corn or a husk of corn. Oh, logo, that's exactly what it means, under the husk. So that's the, the literal translation from Ganyageha, our Mohawk language, into English, so under the husk. And it was circled within a ring of cattail down the down from the cattail would reveal any intrusive presence to the ritual space we call the rites of passage, ohologo, under the husk. We must lead our generations in the future using the symbolo symbology of our Haudenosaunee culture to penetrate the psyche of our community. And that was a wonderful quote from my lovely sister, Wolf Clan sister, Gaji Cook. So um, in saying that is that we have to recognize that each of our children, we have to protect them from any intrusive um, offenses or traumas like Bev was talking about and try and maintain their state of innocence for as long as we can. So, so we hold them close and we guard them. 
not just with a, a, a ring of cattail flag down, but also that corn husk. And that becomes one of the ritual enactments within Ohologo is that we pull out that corn and we recognize that each child born into our community is um, a kernel of corn with its own um, knowledge that needs to be planted and needs to be grown and needs to be recognized for the true gift that they are, which is our kids and no institution and no book or nobody can give that to them but their own caring elders and parents and family and community and nation, okay? So we construct ancient cultural knowledge of a coming of age as a preparatory process for young men and young women as they transition into adulthood. During this transitional period, youth are the most open and the most vulnerable. They benefit from positive adult and peer guidance to help them find and follow a good path. So in saying this, I have to recognize that um, the work that gets done in our community, it's the best medicine is prevention. It is much easier to build a strong boy than it is to repair a broken man. So in that truth, the work has to be done as our, as our young people are growing. And I call forward that ancestral knowledge that um, is so abundant and so full of the provisions that we need for the health and well-being of our young people because if we can prepare them well and begin to show them what their true identity is within the mechanisms and the framework of their, of their people, then they're much better armed when they head into these larger societies. Okay. So going into its 10th year, it, uh, we offer age-appropriate cultural-based teaching and activities in safe, sacred spaces to nurture the physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being of Ogohunwe youth and their supporters. The 20-week program runs from January to May. It promotes a positive understanding of Ogohunwe identity, promotes healing and resilience as well as healthy relationships, behaviors, and communication. Okay, so... <clears throat> this is a calendar of the 20 weeks that we are in the middle of and we're coming at the tail end of it and we have like six weeks left before we send our youth out into the woods. So some of them are energy and body work, sexual health and decision making, wampum belt teachings, UR creation, uh, violence, substance abuse, justice, youth leadership and art, traditional modern relationships, a decolonization workshop, canoe making, canvas art and media projects, survival skills, and Gudji's gonna soon be with us to tell us about learning midwifery from the corn, and um, fasting lodge, uh, site preparations, and we do a work bee where we get all the community and the families uh, on the grounds, on the land, and we totally tell these kids to unplug to pull the plug from their media devices and away from the computer and we return them to the natural habitat of their ancestors which is out on the land and have them connect to the rivers and um, the birds and the animal life, the trees, the sky, uh, the celestial moon and the sun. So there is a tremendous amount of, how can I say? knowledge that these kids are to gain and on purpose and with great intention we, we remove from them those modern comforts and we take away from them those things that they know in order to fill themselves with a greater sense of spirituality and a deeper sense of knowing who they are so we take away the basic human need of water food human contact and we put them out in the woods in the dark for x number of days and so we test their ability to be within their own self and this is where the greatest amount of transformation occurs by being able to leave that child behind and grow that young productive adult that we so desperately need in our community So here we are in our longhouse back in Aguazasne. And we begin 
like we began our day with the Ahonda Galuadiko, which is the acknowledgement of creation. And so there's like 18 to 20 verses in that. And every morning we begin each of our nieces and nephews, because we refer to our young people as our nieces and nephews based on our creation story. And each of these nieces and nephews requires an uncle in order to guide their process, and the nieces require their aunties, not their parents, but their aunties and their uncles in order, in order to guide their journey into uh, adulthood. Okay. Here's some of the activities that we do. We do a lot of awareness, self-expression. Sexual health is a really big one because we want to give them the tools in order for them to have a working knowledge of how their body is going to transition and transform um, from being a child into this wonderful flower of um, reproduction and responsibility. And um, go back. Next. Okay, so here's um, each niece within uh, the Ohologo journey has to weave her own moon basket. So we get our uh, basket weaver, Jack, to come out and he teaches the girls how to put their splint over a mold and they got to uh, learn how to weave. And each year that the girl is followed in a hologa, which is a seven-year process, she weaves a splint to represent her ear, and then she decorates it with a ribbon. And she also gets a rim and handle on that, and that re represents her life journey from being a little girl to a blossomed young woman. And the young boys learn how to work with knives, and they learn how to work with wood, and they also learn how to work with fire. So the basic essential um, skills uh, for survival that doesn't um, come from Googleizing uh, the answers to life. It comes from hands-on, minds-on, and from the doing, and looked out and looked over from their aunties and their uncles. Okay. And this is one of my other favorite pieces is that we <clears throat> try and permeate the consciousness of these young people by returning them to the land. And when I take those young boys who are coming into the change of voice and into um, their man ways, um, I, gra I gather them around these garden mounds and I stand them in front of this pile of dirt. And I tell these young men that I'm going to teach them how to touch a woman and teach them about how it is that they should have a growing consciousness of what woman is. So I have these young adolescent boys take their hands and put it into the garden and into the dirt and they have to mold and mount those dirts into the shape of a woman. So he has to create her head, her arms, her breasts, her abdomen, her hips, her legs, her fingers, and um, so that they have within them that sacredness about what woman is. And you should see the looks on their faces when I tell them that they have to do that. But they do it, and I'm hoping that when they come into that place of having to be with a woman for the first time, that they'll think wisely about it and they'll think sacredly about it. And then after um, they do that, the young nieces, if you could just go back one slide, they come in with the seeds and they plant within that woman, which is in direct relation to our Sky Woman story about what happened to her body when she miss uh, when she died in childbirth, giving birth to the twins. So we, we reenact that and we replicate that in the doing. And we also permeate the consciousness of our young women to recognize the seeds that they carry within them and how sacred a duty and how they need to carry themselves wisely with that knowledge. Okay. And then uh, we also teach them about medicine pouches. We teach them about the waters and the fish that surround our community, okay. 
That's Bev's daughter and granddaughter, by the way. So I love that picture. We teach them, our young nephews, to do survival skills, how to um, start a fire sacredly without a butane lighter. And uh, we use flint, uh, magnesium, uh, bow drill, and we have them find the natural elements within nature in order to create fire. We teach our nephews that man is fire and woman is water. So we always try and keep that in balance. To the right is canoe making. We just finished this up a couple weeks ago. It was in the snow, but we had a, a young man who reconstructed the art of dugout canoe making, and he came up to share his skills with our young people, and that's them learning how to uh, work a log and carve it out, and we're hoping to float those canoes in the spring here. Okay. And here's some of the other activities that we do. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer team building. We took them to um, the mountains in one of our camps, and they're given these team building skills. And we aunties and uncles have to step back, and we give them tasks, and they have to problem solve and figure out a way amongst themselves on on how to do this. And that's my daughter there um, on the left, helping the little girl. And uh, oddly enough, it was the girls who come up with the answers quicker on how to get themselves out of trouble, okay? And uh, we teach them about, part of a young niece's journey into womanhood is that she has to construct for herself a fasting lodge. And um, the men come in and they make the holes for her lodge, but she's the one that has to bend the willow and construct it and tie, tie off her branches. And so that, she, that becomes her holding space from uh, one day to four days where she has to fast for herself. And we also do other things. We take them to a uh, ropes course, and we also do zip lining with them and whitewater rafting. We really try to get them back into um, nature in a really big way. Okay. This is 5 o'clock in the morning. This is our nephews. And so part of Aguazasne, we're basket weavers, so we started to take our baskets off the shelf, remove the dust for them, and we started to strap them back on our young men um, as a way to set my time. Oh, uh, okay. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Okay. All right, then. So I will try and go faster here. But um, we strap them back up when we talk about those things that he carries in his basket. It's a metaphor. And we, we talk to him. If you're going to put uh, marijuana and alcohol and crime and... Uh, pregnant girlfriend in your basket, the load is going to get pretty heavy for you to carry at your age. However, if you take those things of the creator that has given you, like an eagle feather, sage, um, a tobacco, um, a flint, those are light things. And if you learn how to work with those things, you will have a much lifelong journey uh, way more than putting those other things. So it's basically about decision making and how that he's going to decide and what he decides to strap on his back and carry on his shoulders. Okay. Um, so three to four nights, just depending on the age of the niece and nephew, what they can handle, which is determined by their auntie and uncle's counsel. Okay. This is our fasting grounds. It's an aerial view. This is the the hub, but we also have other um, fasting sites. We don't let the boys and girls fast together because that's so lethal. No, but anyways, the boys go like 15 miles to another forest, and the girls are on the grounds closer to where we live, our reserve is. Okay, and um, so we take those stories that live, um, Peacemaker's Journey, which is a story about um, our peacemaker and Hiawatha and how they brought us the great law of peace. So what we do, we don't no longer talk about that story. We have our kids live it. And so when they conclude their fourth year of fasting, which is four days and four nights, we put them in a canoe, and their aunts and uncles canoe them down the river, and they're dressed in buckskin, and eagle feathers, and they we graduate them to the place of their ancestors. And so we, we fully dress them as we once were so that we recognize from which that we come and the people that they belong to. Okay. And so here's all the nieces up on top, their first year, and all the nephews on the bottom. 
And when they come to us at about the age of 13, 14, or 15, this is what they look like. Okay. And this is, oh, I love this. I just love this work. This is what they look like in their third year, second year, and first year. And we sing for them. We dance for them. We feast them. We dress them in our way. And it's all back to a return of our original beginning, the way our ancestors once were, okay? And then the women, because we're a matrilineal society, is the powerhouse of our community. So when the women hurt, everybody hurts. When the woman is happy, everybody's happy, right? So um, the women create the circle and the boy has to um, earn his right. Um, to dance around that circle. And the women open up the door for him and he dances through the circle, but when he's in his fourth ear, the circle is closed to him. And that is a sign that he is now a man and that he has to be able to earn his right back into that circle, okay? And so to date, we have over 500 community members participate in Ohologo. Mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, nieces, nephews, grandparents, tribal leaders, uh, traditional leaders, medicine people of all kinds come out to help these young people uh, on this given week because it, it, it does run about five or six days, this ceremony. So from chopping wood to cooking the food to fixing the feast food to burning tobacco to getting the canoes or the lodges ready, it's a lot of work. It's it's really hard work. We don't sleep for five days straight, but we're there from five in the morning till midnight looking out for these kids. Okay. So to ensure the accessibility for any family that wants to participate, um, we try and keep costs at a minimum. In Ohologo, we require um, donations, a barter system, small grants, and so we also appreciate the Tribes Partnership Fund that helps us out because uh, you know, leather, deer leather isn't cheap these days, and basket weaving isn't cheap, so food isn't cheap, so we piecemeal together whatever it is, and so we um, hope to <clears throat> bring forward um, the beauty of our people inside our, our kids, and so we see less and less kids mimicking other cultures, um, though they still have the free will to do that, but we give them a greater sense of who they are and the identity of who they are. And I love this because now the reciprocity of the work that has been done in the last 10 years is now starting to show itself in our lawn houses, in our high schools, and in our universities. And it's showing a decline in teen pregnancy and showing uh, a greater understanding of our own children and the identity of who they are. And that really, really moves me because you know, um, one of the most profound things, and I'm going to end with this, is that in their fourth year of fasting, they have to come back and they have to make a story, not a story, but they carry wampum and they got to bring back a message to leadership. And I often tell this story is that one of the nephews came back and he was 17 at the time after he got done his fourth year of fast. And he came in front of leadership, in front of the chiefs and clan mothers, and he said this most profound thing that blew me out of the water because it showed me that the level of consciousness that he had. And he said this. He says, uh, I talk to you, my elders. And he says, in the years that I've been here fasting and in the weeks moving toward my fourth year fast, I hear the uncle say over and over again to us young boys that we're paving a path for all the boys that will come after us. He says, but I see it this way, too, that we're paving a path for all you old men that never had this. That blew me away that he could even think that way. So this is some of the work that gets done on the ground in order to bring the health and well-being because we need those young people to stand up for our treaties, to go into litigation into the courts for our land claims. We need them to be doctors and lawyers 
and we need them to be medicine people, to carry the bundles of our ancestors. We need them to be well. We don't need them to be on pills or drugs or alcohol or in the jails. We need them at home to be fathers, to be men, to be mothers. We need them at home, and nobody's going to do that for us but us. So with that, yeah. Thank you, Luis. Uh, gives you a, a good idea of that clan mother spirit that uh, guides uh, these matrilineal communities where the clan mother is uh, a true figure, not just a symbolic uh, position. What I also like about this, even though there's fundraising going on these days, that this really comes out from the ground up. This is something the community is doing and uh, it comes in the, in the context of uh, a, a lot of pain and a lot of uh, difficulty uh, for the young people in these communities. So to see that effort by the parents and the families to pull that together is really a wonder uh, to see these children and these young men and women uh, reach maturity with this kind of guidance.